sekarang. Good afternoon and welcome to TalkBeat's annual legislative review. Our Bureau Chief, TalkBeat Colorado. For those of you who uh, maybe are new to TalkBeat or who received this invitation from a friend, uh, TalkBeat is a nonprofit organization dedicated to bring the effort to improve education for all students. Um, I over here are covering Colorado and I cover the legislature with my colleague, Jason Gonzalez, who's one of our co-moderators here tonight. The start of the session always feels a little bit like Back to season, uh, title and promise, new beginning, maybe a new outfit. And this has become a tradition of sorts for people in the education space in Colorado. Bring together lawmakers who care deeply about um, many of whom have dedicated their professional lives to help students with administrators, parents, kids who are doing work every day, who really need our policymakers to do what it is. School year has been more normal than the previous, uh, a welcome reprieve in some ways, but also a year when we grapple with the fact that pandemic is going away. Many students are struggling academically and emotionally, and school continue to having shortage and the many times student needs they need to meet. So that is the essential work that we are here to talk about today. Before we get into it, uh, a few programming notes. Close our audience questions via the Q&A box. Having technical difficulties, um, you can also and we'll help as we can. Has been a little glitchy this week, um, our control entirely. So we appreciate analysts maybe briefly goes off video uh, and we'll just do our best to um, I wanna extend a big thank you um, to our event sponsor, the Colorado Education Association. Thank you to event partner, the Margaret College Education at the University of Denver. And with that, I am going to introduce um, Michelle Nianuel, Dean of Margaret College Education at the University of Denver remarks. Thank you. We are honored to partner with Chalkbeat on the Colorado 2023 Legislative Preview of Educational Issues today. I am a former public school teacher and I have an enduring commitment to our nation's children, youth and families within and across pre-K through 12th grade since the 1980s. And as a first generation college student, I have an abiding belief in the value of higher education to open doors of opportunity, particularly for the high school graduates of Colorado to improve their quality of life. I've only been in Colorado since June of 2022, and as a fairly recent transplant, I am encouraged that education is a priority for the Colorado legislative body. And from a recent convening of education deans with Governor Polis and members of its cabinet, it was rewarding to realize how important universal pre-K is as an important agenda item for the state of Colorado. Many of us are well aware of how adequate K through 12 school funding is critical to ensuring that students graduate, that they're prepared for college and other career pathways, and that they ultimately serve as examples of a positive return on investments made in them through a high quality education. Certainly as a higher education institution, the University of Denver through the Mortgage College of Education views itself as a critical arm of the state's investment into K through 12 education and higher education, because it is here where a student who has successfully completed secondary and post-secondary programs come to a graduate school whose goal is to improve lives, partner with communities, and contribute to the overall health of Colorado. I am eager, along with everyone in this Zoom room, 
to hear today's legislative discussion on a variety of topics that impact pre-K through 20 uh, education in the state of Colorado. I'm now turning it over to today's moderators, Jason Gonzalez, one of the Chalkbeat reporters, and one of the moderators who who here today who will take it here, take it on from here. Thank you so much. Um, again, my name is Jason Gonzalez, and I am Chalkbeat Colorado's higher education reporter, and I cover uh, education matters in the legislative session. Um, with me today is Karen. So Karen, go ahead and um, jump on and introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Karen Basabez. I am a sophomore at the University of Colorado Denver, and I'm also a policy fellow with Young Invincibles, and I'm just excited to be here. Well, we're excited to have you. Um, and we're excited for the panelists today. So today we have with us Joint Budget Committee Chair, Senator Rachel Zensinger, who is Democrat from Arvada, Senator, Senate Minority Leader, Paul Lundine, who is a Republican from Monument, Senate Education Committee Chair, Senate, Senator Janet Buckner, who is an Aurora Democrat. We also have House Education Committee Chair Representative Barbara McLaughlin, who is a Democrat from Durango, and House Education Vice Chair Representative Matthew Martinez, who is a Democrat from Monte Vista. And y'all can turn on your uh, videos for us and just say hi. Um, and then Karen will kick off questions. So go ahead, Karen. Awesome. We're starting with a lightning round. Panelists, in a couple of sentences, explain your top two education priorities this year. And we can start with anyone who wants to jump in. I'll so jump rank, in. <laughs> rank has its privilege. <laughs> Madam Chair. Oh, okay. Well, I will do this. Um, I, uh, I'm Barbara McLaughlin. I'm from Durango. And uh, my two biggest issues that I think are concerning in education are uh, the money that we're putting into education, and uh, which includes teacher pay and um, getting schools back on track, and uh, teacher shortage. Because... Um, we just don't have enough teachers and educators. I think educator shortage is probably a more accurate description, but um, I think educator shortage and money are the most two most important things. Hi, this is Senator Janet Buckner. I am absolutely thrilled to be here today. And since I'm the new chair of uh, the Senate Education Committee, um, I have a huge responsibility this year. And the two areas that I think are most important to me would be school safety. I keep in touch with a lot of teachers around the state and they're all telling me how frustrated they are because we have a teacher shortage, first of all, which means we have less eyes in the school and they feel that they're being targeted. So school safety is really uh, important because of the mental health crisis, et cetera. And obviously I've mentioned an education shortage of teachers which also includes early childhood school providers as well. So those would be my two main areas of concern, although I have many. I'll go next. I'm State Senator Rachel Zenzinger. I represent Senate District 19, which is Arvada and Westminster in Jefferson County. And I am a Jefferson County guest teacher and the chair of the Joint Budget Committee this year and former chair of the Senate Education Committee. Um, as an educator, uh, I would agree with everything that Rep McLaughlin and Senator Buckner have already mentioned. So I'm gonna mention two new ones that have not been mentioned yet. Uh, I'm continuing to work on uh, special education and in particular special education funding uh, so that we can close the gap on that. And then there's um, two new areas. Uh, one, an area called facility schools, uh, which uh, takes care of children who are in crisis for whatever reason. Uh, it could be from everything from a mental health crisis to um, uh, children who are in the juvenile justice system to uh, children that are in congregate uh, foster care. Um, 
for whatever reason, uh, they are living and attending school in a facility rather than in uh, one of our uh, traditional public schools. And uh, we have lost a number of those facility schools uh, over the years, they've diminished. And so we uh, need to address, uh, put together a plan to address how we're gonna support those facility schools into the future. So those would be the two things. And then uh, just my little third thing, which is uh, kind of a third wheel, uh, and that would be adult education. Senator Lundy. Um, it's great to be with you, Erica, Jason, um, Karen. Thank you so much. Grateful to CEA for sponsoring and uh, Mortgage College for participating as a partner as they have for so many years. I think this is possibly my ninth year on this panel. I think I did it four years in a row on the House, and now I've done it four. This is my fifth year from the Senate. Um, it's, it's an honor to be with you, and um, although we don't always see education uh, the same way we all do see education as of paramount importance in the lives of an individual, um, and quite frankly, and for the future benefit of, of our society. Um, uh, Jason, to your question, uh, my focus will be, uh, as it has been for uh, 11, 12, 13 years now, since the time I served on the State Board of Education, making the funding model more about the student. Um, trying to create greater flexibility and greater inertia in the education experience by making the money about the student first. And of course, um, I have desperate concerns that we are hemorrhaging quality teachers out of the system right now, and we absolutely must do something about that. Um, I'm a little more focused in my perspective on that issue, perhaps, than, than uh, uh, the Chair McLaughlin I would say I want to see the um, paychecks of student facing classroom teachers expand significantly. I honor, respect, and I'm grateful for all people that we would call educators, whether they're cafeteria workers, bus drivers, gardeners, the people that support our education system. I honor them and I'm grateful for them, but really want to focus the resources in the student facing classroom teachers. So that's my first thing is, is really doing something about the funding model to make it about students and, and high quality classroom facing teachers. The second thing is finding greater flexibility um, for the students specifically. And we can do that in any number of ways. One way I'll be leaning in is to further expand the career development incentive program that has been a bipartisan supported effort over the last several years to give it greater inertia and movement forward. Um, so thank you very much for that. And I, I want to welcome uh, Representative-elect uh, Martinez to the conversation. It's good to see you. Glad to have you in the education policy conversation, sir. I can get off the mute, then uh, <laughs> I'd be happy to do it. So, hey, thank you again. Um, it's an honor uh, uh, to be here. I'm Representative uh, Elect uh, Martinez. Um, I'll be here uh, officially, Rep. Martinez, on Monday. Um, I'm from House District 62, which encompasses the San Luis Valley, Wed, Pinal, and Pueblo um, as well. Um, my day job is in higher education, so that's where a lot of my focus um, will, will be in this upcoming session. Um, as a higher education administrator for almost 10 years. Um, and then uh, as a part of that, it's really, you know, working on trying to be able to get um, higher education institutions, rural higher education institutions, um, a little bit more funding, um, as well as putting a focus on the incarcerated um, uh, college population as well too, with the onset of Second Chance Pell uh, uh, and most incarcerated students nationwide being able to have access to those funds for the first time in over 30 years. Um, so that, that's where my focus will be on for this next session. Thank you all so much. Um, and so we're going to jump into the questions um, really on, on specific topics. And it's the, the one that's on everyone's mind um, that the audience sent in, in questions about that we want to ask about, obviously, is on school finance. So um, this question is for Senator Zen Zenzinger and Senator Lundin. How likely is a rewrite, a real right, rewrite, not nibbling around the edges of the School Finance Act? And how will that process include people from across different political spectrums and from different communities? Well, it's a very good question. Uh, the School Finance Interim Committee 
over the last six years, I would say, have uh, dove in and really explored this question from a lot of different angles. Um, I know that it may on the outside appear, and even on the inside to some degree, appear to be somewhat frustrating by the lack of progress, but uh, I don't actually see it that way because we have made some incremental progress in some different areas, um, including everything from how we define and look at at-risk students to uh, how we are supporting our special education students and funding them more appropriately. Uh, we have made um, some minor tweaks uh, to the formula over the past couple of years through the School Finance Act, including uh, greater uh, investments in our English language learners, who also happen to be at-risk students before our formula only supported one or the other uh, with additional funding. Um, so we are still faced though with some challenges around that formula, making sure that it really is supporting our students to the best of, of our ability as a state. And so to that end, the committee has uh, granted Chair McCluskey uh, uh, permission to move forward with uh, drafting legislation to rewrite the formula. Um, we have not seen a draft of that bill yet, uh, but I do know that it will be influenced by a, a whole series of conversations that we've had over these last six years. In particular, I expect to see some changes around uh, the size factor. We recognize that some of our rural remote, remote communities are just not receiving the type of support that they need in our current formula. And we have propped that up over years with some one-time funding for rural schools, but uh, we recognize that that's not sustainable and we need to do something that's a little bit more just in that area. Uh, we've had some really productive conversations Hi. around the cost of living adjustment. And I know that Senator Lundeen will pick it up from there <laughs> on that cost of living adjustment. That that was the friendliest time um, notification I think we've ever, we've ever had. So um, I, I I will try to avoid hearing that that. But at the same time, I'm grateful that that marker is out there for us, um, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Chair of the JVC, and and always a force and presence in in education. Zenziger, thank you for your comments. Yes, I, I believe you're absolutely correct. I'll I'll take the question question on directly and give a very direct answer and then I'll expand upon that. The question was nibbling around the edges are fundamental. I think the chances of fundamental rewrite is near zero. Um, continuing incremental change is very probable. So that's my read. I would like to be told, Lundin, you're wrong. This is the year we're going to rewrite the whole thing. We're going to make it about the student. And you can imagine the joy and the conversation and, and the uh, uh, influence I would seek to exert on that particular wholesale rewrite, but I don't think that's likely. Um, Senator Zinziger was correct. Special education at risk. Those are areas we've made progress on. Um, the cost of living adjustment factor, which from my perspective is a more than billion dollar parking lot of funds that may or may not be um, having specific meaningful influence on student needs. It has very meaningful um, resource for district needs and for some school needs. It, it's more of an institutional prop than a student specific element. The cost of living adjustment factor is likely to see some um, rework. Another area where I believe we may make some progress is the 15% of students that are now served in charter schools. The CSI students are still underfunded on a consistent level. I, I would like to think we will make progress at making sure every student, thorough and uniform is what we are called to by the Constitution, that every student, including those CSI authorized charter school students, would rece receive the same level of funding instead of a lower level of funding than their peers who are in district schools and may live across the street or down the hall based on how families choose to um, have their students participate in various schools. I beat the time. <laughs> uh, Susan is our, our best timer. Um, Senator Zenziger, I'm gonna jump into a JBC question real quick. Um, tell us, are, are we going to be able to eliminate the budget stabilization factor this year? Um, what other priorities are competing with fully funding K-12? I would say probably no, we're not going to be able to eliminate it this year. We are going to be able to continue to significantly buy it down. 
The challenge that we have with completely eliminating the budget stabilization factor this year is that we would not be able to do that next year. The distance between where we are now and zero is too great if we were to move that to the next year's budget and try to cover it plus the inflationary factor. Uh, we're trying really hard not to create a cliff effect. Uh, it's very difficult increasing pay for your teachers on unpredictable one-time funding. So we're trying to create a very steady, predictable uh, situation uh, where we're continuing to make progress on that budget stabilization factor, but in such a way that doesn't create a new crisis the following year. Our next question is for Representative Martinez and Representative McLaughlin. Um, how do you guys plan to address the current teacher shortage, especially in the rural areas? Representative Martinez, do you want to start us off? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I think really first is is being able to address the funding needs of the um, rural institutions. You know, right now they've been suffering um, a lot, um, and you know, COVID hits um, or recessions hit in rural areas harder. They stay longer, um, and so being able to making sure that those institutions have the finances to be able to bring on and retain. Uh, really good teachers and instructors, um, I, I think is the really the, the first step. And then I think also that is um, competitive pay. Um, that that's that's a huge factor in, in why a lot of people leave the rural areas. They find better jobs or better paying jobs. Uh, they find stuff that that's going to be more adapted for their family. So I think you know really addressing those two factors first, I think is is um, critical up in this next session, um, and being able to uh, really put an investment in that. I forgot to say thank you to everybody when I first started here. I just kind of jumped in and said, here's what we need to solve. So I'll go back and say thank you first. So here we go. Here's something else to solve, though. Um, I'm from Southwest Colorado. I am about 30 minutes from New Mexico. And New Mexico teachers, um, their legislature has said they're going to get, I think it's a minimum of um, $60,000 each. So all of our teachers are now driving 30 minutes to get a lot more money than we have. So um, it, it's a real issue in Southwest Colorado. We, you know, we're far away from things. We can't just drive to the next community for a job. Um, the next community is often four hours away. So um, not as easy as it sounds. So um, teacher pay, educator pay is really, really serious um, in rural Colorado altogether. Um, we have more expenses. Um, we have superintendents who also are bus drivers and um, special ed teachers and substitutes. And then on the weekends, they come in and clean the place. So um, we're already stretched really, really thin with everything. So if I had a magic wand, I would know how to solve this problem. But I think if we don't keep talking about it, which um, I know JBC and um, educators are talking about it a lot at the Capitol, and we just have to figure out a way to address it um, to give these rural schools the money they need to get the teachers they need, um, we have to be really, really flexible. We have um, some PE teachers who have become English teachers this year. And as a former English teacher, that kind of puts the fear of God into me, but here we go. We're going to do it anyway. So, um, but we have to, you know, we have to teach our kids and um, the teachers are amazing. They are, um, you know, they're hauling the load. They're not quitting on us. Um, none of them have gone into this for the pay, thank goodness but it would be nice to tell them that we appreciate them um, for all the work that they're doing and pay them. So um, no magic wand on this end, but I'm hoping that we can keep that word out that um, I'm speaking for rural teachers at this point, all teachers need it, but especially rural teachers really need, we need some more money into our schools. So, thank you so much for your responses. Senator Buckner, this question comes from our audience. Will 2023 be the year that Colorado joins 40 other states in screening for dyslexia, the number one cause of reading failure? The State Dyslexia Working Group has recommended it since 2020. Well, um, thank you for that question. And thank you for my dyslexia family friends. I call them my family because many of you know that uh, I have an endorsement in learning disabilities and I have a daughter, a grown daughter, who has severe dyslexia issues. I can't make any promises, 
But as always, we are going to look at all of the legislation that is going to help those kids who have specific learning disabilities and those with dyslexia. Unfortunately, we've tried to make strides every year in this area and we haven't gotten there yet. And it's frustrating for me as a parent of, uh, of a person with dyslexia. It's also frustrating for me as someone who used to test all the kids who were going into the school, knowing that those kids with dyslexia, were their, meet, their needs were not being met. So all I can say is all of you who know me know that I collaborate, I listen to everyone, and I will do the same as chair of education this year, but I can't make any promises, but it is an area that we will definitely uh, give special attention to this year. I feel that as the new chair of education in the Senate, it's just my responsibility to do everything I can uh, for all kids but especially those kids whose needs are not being met. And this also is something that is frustrating. I wanna make sure that we stay student centric. Yes, our teachers are crucial, but this is all about the students. And we just have to make sure that that is foremost in our minds with every decision that we make. You've got an amen corner over here, Senator Yay. Buckner. <laughs> Thank you. I love this whole team of educators. Um, I have this special relationship with Senator Lundeen. We were in the house together. Uh, and I'm thrilled to work with my friend, um, Representative McLaughlin. And I have this, I have, I feel like I have an emergency cord that I can reach for in, in Senator Zenzinger, since she was chair of ed, and now she's on JBC. And I also have a friend in Nancy Todd, uh, who has been my mentor ever since I came to the state capitol. So she will not let me forget uh, if I don't keep those students foremost in the minds of everyone. But I really do feel blessed and I can't wait to work with you, Representative Martinez. And I also have an amazing vice chair who is listening in today. Uh, Janice Marchman is a new senator former educator and school board member. So she is going to be a real boost to me and to the education community. Thank you so much, Senator Buckner. And I look forward to covering um, all of the twists and turns during the year. Um, Senator Lundeen and Senator Zendiger, this is questions for you. Uh, while an audit called the state's accountability system reasonable, it seems likely school leaders want to push for changes. What needs to be done to improve accountability for students, if anything? Well, I'm looking forward uh, to joining uh, Representative Byrd on exploring uh, the answers to that audit and, and doing a little bit more um, deeper dive into what are some of the potential areas that we could take up from that report and actually implement. Uh, I wanna be very cautious about uh, a knee-jerk reaction though. Uh, I don't wanna just dive in and, and uh, right away become prescriptive with legislation without giving the education community, the uh, trained professionals, the teachers, the principals, the uh, as uh, Senator Lundeen likes to say, the student facing uh, uh, professionals an opportunity to weigh in on that and to have really good productive um, discussions about what our next steps should be. So um, I'm the Senate sponsor of a House bill uh, that will start with Representative Byrd in the House to take up that, uh, that report and figure out what some good responsible next steps would be. But I would say, given the initial results, it's not gonna be a wholesale change to how we uh, address accountability, uh, but it will um, inspire, I think, some common sense steps. Um, it, and I, I, um, I guess my, my way of looking at this would be audit always sounds like a black and white binary 
you know, yes or no sort of question. It's either in balance or it's out of balance. Um, this particular effort by the, uh, the state auditor's office through the legislative audit committee um, retained essentially a management consulting, education consulting type of group to evaluate and say, you know, find out are there places for improvement? And the result that came back was um, we're in pretty good shape. But that having been said, I think nothing is more important. And, I, and this comes out of my experience as the owner, um, uh, majority owner generally, and, and president CEO of a number of service companies, all of which involve the ability of human beings to interact with other human beings in a beneficial and meaningful way. And we were always trying to measure and understand how are we are how are we doing? Are we, are we serving our our customers well? Are there ways we can improve? Um, and it was always in this nebulous space of it's a human interaction. How on earth can you measure that with precision? Well, that's very much like what we're talking about here. We're trying to understand exactly what's happening between the teacher and the team of folks in the building who support the teacher um, and the students' result. And so, are there ways to continually improve? Of course, there are. We always need to be pursuing better understanding of how we are performing. Um, and at the same time, even when the measures aren't as good as we'd like them to be, we need to pay attention to the measures and, and own the result that comes out of that. I, you know, as, as you heard me say, many the, the results coming out of the pandemic, we needed to put an asterisk next to those as you would in a scorebook for you know baseball scores or whatever. Yeah, this was an unusual circumstance, but at the same time, don't dismiss the information. Learn what you can from the information you have. So it's an ongoing conversation. Uh, I, I think we should learn and adapt from what we have. And if we can find better ways of understanding exactly our effectiveness in delivering service, we should identify those um, as well. Aha, I didn't quite make it. <laughs> almost. <laughs> Thank you. So Representative McLaughlin, Senator Lundeen, and Senator Buckner, my brother and I went to different high schools in different districts, and my classes seemed more rigorous than his did. Which brings me to my question, um, how can Colorado ensure students in different school systems still maintain a similar quality of education? Yeah, let me jump in first. Um, the, the, the arbiter of that decision, the arbiter of that result was um, your parent or parents. Um, the, the, the reality is they identified, I mean, you, you in the question, um, surface the notion that one experience was more rigorous than the others. Well, when you know that, and when when parents know this is a more rigorous result than that, or a more rigorous program than than something else, I think parents naturally gravitate toward that greater rigor. Um, so that's something that I, over time creates equilibrium and balance. And and so I have always felt that the most important accountability is the parents' belief and trust and understanding of, and that's why transparency to the parents in terms of how a school or a district is actually doing is so very, very important. It gives the parents the ability to say, you know, I, I think for, my, for this particular child, that particular school is the better option. For this other particular child, that other particular school might be a better option. So I, I love to give the parents as much transparency and information as we can and let them be the ultimate arbiter. And then the, the system needs to rise up and respond with higher quality service to the parents, students as seen by the parents. Colorado is a uh, local control state, so the, we as the government give money to the schools and they decide how it's spent. And they also decide, um, you know, we have standards that they have to meet, but they, they kind of work on the rigor together. And I think um, Senator Lundin is correct that I, I believe that if, if parents, uh, we want parent involvement in schools, and if parents believe that um, the rigor isn't there, they should absolutely step forth and say, we want more. I think think any teacher would ever go, oh, I don't want to give them more. I mean, we're excited when um, teachers, you know, when parents come in and say, um, this class is too easy for my child. So um, I think parents and community members need to know that uh, that avenue is open, that they can go to their schools and talk to teachers and, um, you know, and get what they need out of the program. So 
Um, I'm sorry that you had to experience that, but uh, I think that just that sometimes just happens when you have local control. We don't have any control over the rigor of um, the courses. Karen, I really appreciate that question. And I thoroughly agree with my two uh, friends uh, and educators, Representative McLaughlin and Senator Lundeen. Parental involvement is crucial, but it's really frustrating when you have parents who don't speak English language as well as they would like to. They don't feel like they're being listened to. They're embarrassed. Um, it's also frustrating when I hear from parents who live in uh, more urban areas uh, where they feel like their kids are not getting the best education possible. I mean, wouldn't it be a great world if every student got the same education? And we know that's not happening. So I think it is our job to make sure that every school district is accountable. Yes, there's local control, but we also have to make sure that every school district is accountable and doing everything they can to improve the education of every student in that school. We all know that if a student doesn't have reading skills by third grade, we know what their results are going to be. It's going to unfortunately raise that school to prison pipeline issue. So this is a real multifaceted, real multifaceted question, Karen. I wish there were an easy answer. So we have local control, we have parental involvement. We also have that need for every student to get the best education possible. And I don't know what the magic answer is to that, but parents have to feel more comfortable approaching their teachers. It's really frustrating for me, for example, when my kids were in school, which was a long time ago, I had one student who um, was gifted and the other student had dyslexia. So unfortunately, their results were different. So like I said, it's really complicated and my answer may sound a little bit confusing, but I wish I knew what the magic bullet was to that question, Karen. Thank you all for those responses. Um, we're gonna move on to some higher education questions. So Senator Zenziger and uh, Representative Martinez, um, while Colorado schools are proposed to get enough money to operate, that comes with the ability to raise tuition by 4%. How does Colorado not just tackle the cost of college for students, but the perception of what it costs? That is an excellent question. And we actually dug into that question uh, at the JVC this year when we uh, talked about higher education. And uh, one of our JVC analysts pointed out that there is a tremendous amount of uh, resources there for students. Uh, and, and our challenge really is to get them to understand that for the most part, we can really support them through uh, Pell eligibility. If we can get them to complete their FAFSA, <laughs> uh, the types of uh, supports that uh, the state has has come to the table with. Uh, so it is true that um, there, there is a lot of free money uh, that is left out on the table. On the other hand, uh, it is entirely unaffordable right now. And so even with those types of resources and uh, with the knowledge that there are some, some good uh, supports out there for you, um, we still have to tackle the affordability issue. And we can't do that if we are not giving our university and colleges enough to cover their base operating costs, uh, which I believe is uh, what is, we're currently offering right now um, in uh, this year's budget proposal. It doesn't meet core minimum costs. And that is with a 4% tuition increase, which is just not realistic, honestly. Uh, we can't continue to increase uh, tuition year after year after year as a way of closing the gap. So uh, I think that the state has to make a greater investment into the base uh, funding for colleges and universities if we really want to tackle this affordability issue. Um, yeah, I would I would agree with um, Senator Zenzinger uh, on a lot of that. Um, you know, working in higher education for the last ten years, we've seen um, nationwide a decrease um, in enrollment, which puts a strain on these institutions, uh, particularly our rural institutions, uh, who who struggle you know every day. Um, let alone you know with this, um, I think with the recession that happened, you typically have seen an increase in enrollment um, in past years. And that did not happen this time. So then you add that into the mix of declining enrollment um, with that as well. 
Um, I would wholeheartedly agree with uh, Senator Zenzinger that, you know, while, you know, we, we um, have a lot of good resources out there, we have a lot of access to uh, different funding tools. Uh, I think the problem is, is, is a lot of places are looking where Pell is not stretching as far as it is it once did. And being able to figure out how do we bridge that gap? Because if the Pell eligibility is not going to increase, um, or, or the, the amount that the students are eligible for is increasing, but tuition continues to increase, um, you know, really it's, it's defeating that purpose of, of what, what it was meant to do is helping um, low income um, first time students being able to to, to start in college uh, and be successful. And so really um, adding additional state support uh, for uh, particularly our rural institutions is something that's absolutely paramount uh, because, um, you know, going back to Representative McLaughlin's um, point um, before, you know, like prime example, I'm, I'm from the San Luis Valley. Uh, we have uh, Adams State and Trinidad State. And so if you don't like either of those institutions, it's not like you you have a whole whole bunch where you can go to that that's nearby your house. Um, you're having to drive two, four hours, you know, to, to get that. And so I think that, you know, making sure that we're investing in that, realizing their importance in those rural areas um, and being able to say, hey, they may need some more, more assistance because they're critical to not only their community, uh, but the students that, that are that are enrolling there. And Representative Elect Martinez brought up a really good point um, about uh, the the cost and, and the supports that are out there and how they just don't cover as much. A really good example of that that we learned about was last year when we were working on providing uh, greater supports for foster youth. They already had the Chafee Grant. The Chafee Grant was supposed to provide enough um, support, enough funding to get them at least an associate's degree. So two years of community college. At this point, um, the funding that is um, uh, made available to them won't cover two years of community college given uh, the costs uh, today. So um, what used to be covered back way back when is just not um, uh, cutting it right now. The, the dollars are being stretched too much. And so uh, the gaps are greater uh, than they've ever been. So even though there are these tremendous supports out there, they're just not able to, to do the job. Representative Martinez, I'm going to move a question just because I know you have freshman orientation right now. So um, I know out of respect for your time. So I wanted to talk about um, something that you work in and, and you have a, a background in. Um, so the com Colorado Community College System wants lawmakers to consider a package of bills to meet the federal expansion of prison college programs. What needs to be considered to help those students successfully earn degrees and apply them after they get out? Sure. Well, great question. Um, yes, I actually, um, up until yesterday, I was the director for the Adams State University Prison College Program. Um, so, and that's actually something that, that's near and dear to my heart as well. Um, that is actually my first bill that I'm going to be introducing as well as an earn time off for um, incarcerated students. So they will, if, if I get it passed, uh, they'll earn one year off their sentence per college degree that they earn. Um, they'll earn uh, six months off their sentence for every certificate that they earn. Um, so using that in conjunction with the start onset of Pell Grant funding for incarcerated students in July of 2023, uh, I think that, that that really it's 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 prime time for us to be able to step up and say, hey, you know, let let let's do this. Um, so you already have a few institutions that are offering uh, quality education um, inside DOC facilities um, to these um, students, but I think you know really again it's time that we can start expanding this and really, really do well. If you look at this rate, and I love this rate, so if an incarcerated student earns their master's degree while incarcerated, uh, their recidivism rate is 0%, which absolutely shows that if you get them connected to education, they are not gonna go back in, they become productive members of society, they get their lives back together, uh, which ultimately at the end of the day, saves the state money um, being able to do that. And so um, really, th th this is this is a really good opportunity because there's not a whole lot of um, upfront dollars that the state needs to provide because, again, that's been done on the federal level. Um, we just really need to say, OK, you know, what other institutions can offer this and really be able to diversify their education. Um, so, you know, is, is there more technical degrees that we can offer? Is there more engineering? Is there more th more things that are not being offered in there that we can that other institutions can be able to get a part of and really being able to offer that? But I think the most important piece to this is we have to really, really be careful um, looking at this because it is a vulnerable population. A lot of them 
um, may have only earned their GED, and we don't want to see predatory institutions coming in and, and offering them a degree that's not worth its weight in paper. Um, and so being able to make sure that we're vetting that, making sure that they're going to benefit from this, um, because ultimately the schools are going to benefit if they're delivering a quality education. Good okay. job. Um, so, yeah. Thank you for that answer. Um, <laughs> Karen? Thank you. Uh, Representative McLaughlin and Senator Buckner, this next question is about FAFSA completion. Colorado ranks near the bottom in terms of filling out federal financial aid forms, meaning that college students leave out millions on the table. Um, Young Invincibles would like lawmakers to make filling out the FAFSA a graduation requirement. Would you support this idea and why or why not? I'll go first. Hey, <laughs> yes, I would be supportive. Uh, it's, it's frustrating how much money is left on the table. Um, so an education in this area and assistance would be greatly appreciated and it would help those students obviously. So yes, I would support that. Um, I would too, as, as long as we have a special compensation for um, like foster children who may not have that information. Um, the dreamers who may not have that information around, you know, we have to make sure that everybody has a fair chance with FAFSA and not just um, people whose parents have filed um, tax returns and have the time to sit at the kitchen table and talk with them. So um, we need a little bit more help out there. But yes, absolutely. I would love to have every student get every dollar they can. And, yeah. and once again, um, Representative McLaughlin brought up a, a great point. Unfortunately, a huge segment of the population never gets this information. So we really need to improve how this information is dispersed and make sure that no one is left out. And I answer that question because I have a no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I totally recognize the value of the FAFSA, and I want to do anything and everything we can to get more students to complete that, but I would not want to tie it as a, a graduation requirement, because getting back to the earlier questions around accountability, and one of the questions that was post, posted in the chat here by, I believe, Kevin Vick, we already have so much that are on our educators' plates, uh, as so much responsibility that they have to cover. And when it comes to things like accountability, we wanna make sure that the graduation requirements are actually tied back to their learning. Um, I, I am reluctant to throw in something that is not um, academic that, that doesn't reflect their learning as a, a condition for graduation. Um, it doesn't mean that I don't support the concept of uh, increasing FAFSA. I think it's critical. I just wouldn't want to make it a graduation requirement, personally. Um, yep. Definitely a lot. If, to I, if I could just add something to that, um, I wish, um, my vice chair could be on this call today and she's listening in, but she's not on screen. But I do know that she's running a bill with another state representative um, completing FAFSA and CAFSA in conjunction um, with other parts of the program. With, and she's also working with Young Invincibles to push this into public libraries and nonprofits too. So uh, Senator Zinzinger, you know how much I respect you. I want to talk to you more about this so I make sure that I'm not misunderstanding any portions of this possible legislation. Uh, but I also believe that there is a need for this, but let's see how we can work together uh, and to make this a viable piece of legislation. Thank you for those very insightful answers. Um, the, next, the next question is for Senator Lundin and Representative Martinez. Governor Polis wants free training in certain in-demand fields. Do you support this? And what else can be done to get older adults, especially, back to school to gain the skills necessary to meet the current job opportunities? Rep. Martinez, go ahead. Sure, I think uh, making training affordable uh, for all those necessary, I think is um, is absolutely necessary. Um, I also wanna make sure that those um, places that are offering those trainings are, are being compensated as well too, just because same thing, we're all in a crunch in the, in the higher education bubble, but 
you know, I think that, that, that this is a really good first step um, in being able to get them um, the, the training and the skills necessary so that um, they, they can be able to do what they need to. And sometimes um, that can mean, you know, people that have already had previous degrees um, that are switching job fields. Um, and this really helps them out to being able to get on that path um, at a more accelerated rate. Um, I know there's other institutions that have done uh, programs where they have uh, a bachelor's degree already, and then they want to get trained to be a teacher or they want to get a certificate in this, you know, and they have an expedited training program so that they can do that. Um, so um, I'm absolutely um, in favor of making as, as low cost um, as possible. Um, I also want to make sure that, that the institutions delivering that are, are being compensated for that as well, too. Um, and my answer will be more um, brief and conceptual. The reality is the world keeps changing and we need to grow as individuals. We need to learn as individuals. We need to train ourselves as individuals for that changing world, um, both for professional reasons and just for relational reasons. It's very important. And so conceptually, I'm very supportive of that. was in conversation with the governor a few days ago with regard to any number of different alternative later in high school and beyond high school opportunities that I believe we should and could lean into. And then, I... <laughs> no. Okay. And then Senator Zenziger, I saw your comment down there. So go ahead and um, um, tell us about your bill. So the tail end of that question had to do with adult education and how we can get more uh, non-traditional uh, students back into the classroom. And right now in Colorado, we have about 400,000 adults that do not have a high school diploma or its equivalency. And among that 400,000 adults, approximately 40% of them uh, do not even have uh, a ninth grade skill set. So um, I'm working on a pre-file bill uh, with my colleague in the Senate, Senator Kirkmeyer, and um, Representative Kipp in, in the House and uh, Representative Mark Catlin on increasing our supports for adult education, in particular for the adult basic education component. Uh, right now, most of our adult education in Colorado is really aligned with workforce goals. And so it's meant to support those um, adult students who you know, probably dropped out their senior year or they could study uh, really hard and pass that GED test. Um, they can complete in under a year and then uh, find some sort of a, a certificate or, or a training um, certificate of some sort and move right into the workforce probably because the majority of them are already in the workforce. But that significant portion of learners that are under a ninth grade level, they're not gonna be able to do that. And right now we just don't have the proper supports to be able to help them close the uh, achievement gap and actually obtain an adult education diploma or, um, or its equivalency in Colorado. So one of the significant changes that we're doing is we're working with our community-based providers who provide the adult education settings um, for our adult learners. Uh, community colleges and our local district colleges, for example, are one third of those providers. And so um, we are going to try and grant them the ability to actually confer the high school diplomas that they are um, already doing the education for. Uh, right now, only the K-12 institutions can give those diplomas, Hi. even though they provide none of the education. And Senator Buckner, I saw your comment as well. Uh, we are running short on time, um, but if you can say it in 30 seconds, uh, we'll move on to the next question after. Wouldn't it be great if you could go to a school where your transportation was provided, where daycare is provided, so you can get your college, I mean, your high school diploma? I have a bill that's going to address that. Two generational supports. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. The next question is about mental health. Um, it's for Senator Buckner and Senator Zenzinger. How can Colorado better tailor mental health services um, to student needs? For example, the Cherry Creek School District started a mental health program. Is it possible for other districts to do the same right now? Yes, um, I my Senate district includes uh, Cherry Creek Schools. Uh, I'm really 
pleased and so supportive of what they're doing in the mental health arena. And yes, I think other school districts can do the same and use those uh, school districts as an example on how they can form their programs. Um, the uh, mental, mental health issue is just overwhelming. We know that teachers are frustrated because they're having to take on the role of a teacher, or mental health provider, et cetera. So yes, I really believe that this is an area that we need to keep working on. We have to provide enough money for those mental health needs, but um, we can have some of these flagship school districts uh, be the example for other school districts around the state. I would say that this is an issue that we are trying to tackle from a joint budget committee perspective because most of the programming that we have here in Colorado is based on one-time money or pilot programs. And I think what we have learned over the past couple of years is that we need to make those much more integral to um, everyday education versus one-offs and, and, and little special pilot programs that term out. Um, because mental and behavioral health is really important to the success of our students. But not only that, we also experimented with providing some mental, greater mental health supports for educators. And we did that through a bill that Rep McLaughlin and I passed um, two years ago on increasing educator uh, workforce. And um, we, it was a pilot program. We got a study back that talked about the efficacy of that program and it was amazing. Um, it was well utilized, it was well loved. Um, it, teachers wanted it back. And so I think um, now that we have uh, feedback on, on how well that that program worked, um, and it was through the University of um, Denver, I think it was their Anschutz uh, Medical School that um, uh, provided the, the program. But now that we have the feedback that this is something that teachers, educators want and need, I think we need to look uh, to find ways to support that financially within our budget. All right, we're going to turn to our last couple questions here, um, and we're a little over time, so we'll just uh, we'll speed through these. Um, this is a, actually an audience submitted question for Senator Buckner and Representative McLaughlin. Now that Democrats have a super majority, what are they going to do about Tabor reform? Mm -hmm. um, Could you repeat that again, please? Sorry. Now that Democrats have a super majority, what are you all going to do about Tabor reform? Well, you sure know how to get those <laughs> questions in there are very difficult. <laughs> and as the new chair of education, this is something that I have thought about. Um, you know, I'll be honest with you. I am not sure. But just because we have the majority, and I know that um, Representative McLaughlin feels the same way I do, I am not going to allow hubris to come into this we are going to work with everyone in collaboration. Um, and just because we have the majority doesn't mean that we're going to uh, run over everyone. We're going to be good listeners. And I am not sure what the answer is to that question, but we do know that um, if we buy down the BS factor, that's going to affect teacher pay. Uh, if we have a Tabor sur surplus, is that going to be used for teacher pay? I, I honestly can tell you that I do not know the answer to this question. And I think it's going to take a lot of discussion and collaboration and understanding to answer this question. And I'll say one more thing. I don't think this is just a Democrats issue. Representative McLaughlin. Oh God, I was so hoping she would say something. I go, yeah, that's a good idea. I agree with that. But she, she said exactly what I was thinking. Like, I don't know. You know, it's a uh, Tabor is in our constitution. So it's not something that we just do something with, uh, whether we like it or not, or alter it, whether we like it or not. Um, it's much more complicated from that. Um, it took the vote of the people to get it in there. And if the people want to get it out of there, we also need a vote of the people to get it out. So it's not just a legislative thing. Um, I think um, in many ways, you know, we passed this in 1992 and not one other state has ever copied it. And I think there has to be a reason for that, that um, gosh, if it was such a great idea in 92, why hasn't somebody since then copied Tabor and not one state has. So I think it says a lot. 
I think we need to do something, but I don't know who we is. Um, it's certainly not the legislature. We can't pass a bill for it. Um, I don't know how many parts it's broken up into, but it would be a lot of votes and a lot of constitutional um, amendment votes of the people to do it. So um, we need to get everybody on board, whether they like it, whether we can work with it, work around it, um, enjoy it, whatever people think of Tabor, um, but it has to be a whole state looking at it, not just a legislator. Is there any talk right now of, of that whole state conversation of, of putting this before voters? Um, I hear talk, I've heard talk since 92 about it. So, um, <laughs> You know, um, I'm not sure. I haven't heard anything officially about it. And maybe somebody can help me on this, but um, Tabor's in a lot of different parts. And I don't know how many votes or how many elections you would have to have to address each of those parts. It's kind of like a whack-a-mole that if you get rid of one, it pops up. So you either kind of do them all at once or not. But I don't know how many parts there. I heard, I've heard rumors of, you know, everywhere from like three to 18. So um it's all going to be a lot of elections if we have to do all of them. So, uh, but we kind of hear from the people on that. Right. And Jason, this is something else we need to remind people. It takes two thirds to refer, to refer a constitutional measure. And we do not have two thirds. And that, that actually helps bring us into the next question for Senator Lundeen. Um, how do you make the Republican perspective heard and influence policy from the minority? Yeah, it, at the end of the day, it's about representing people and representing their perspectives. Um, the reality is many of the issues that uh, people, the people of Colorado care deeply about, don't have a doggone thing to do with whether you've got an R behind your name or a D behind your name. They're things that people care about. And a better education for their children is something everybody cares about. And, you know, we're turning in a challenged result. Um, clearly, the, the pandemic we went through put us on our heels in, in meaningful ways. I mean, when you look at the, the data coming out of NAEP, um, we've got a problem in math where our math scores are declining faster than the national average, which is new. That's Colorado hasn't had those sorts of issues before. We have declines when everybody has declines, but we've seen seemingly lost uh, even more ground with regard to math. I know that's an issue of concern to the governor. He and I spoke about it, as I mentioned, we talked a couple of days ago. So um, it, it doesn't really come down to the the uh, the makeup of the 33, 18, and 1. It comes down to the fact that the people of Colorado want us to come together in meaningful ways and deal with a number of very important issues. Um, and so we will lean in. Clearly, I have a different perspective on many issues than, than perhaps uh, Chair Zenziger might have or Chair Buckner might have. But the reality is, we have more commonality than we have difference on most of the education or the matters of education, the issues that surround education. So um, I, I'm not certain that, uh, that the uh, political winds of the, the past election that were driven by things beyond a conversation around education will have much effect on the education conversation we have this year. And Senator Zenziger, before we move on to the live audience questions um, that are being submitted, um, are there any education policy um, issues that you see, you know, beneficial of pushing through because you have a Democratic supermajority? No, <laughs> I don't actually. I think every major improvement or um, uh, item that we've done for education, we've done in partnership uh, with our colleagues across the aisle. So I, I cannot think of a single thing that I would just, by the benefit of having a, a super majority in one chamber and a near super majority of the other chamber, that we would do uh, without our, our Republican colleagues. Um, you know, you asked a question earlier about whether this was the year for the big uh, formula rewrite, right? <laughs> and, and I would say that that's probably the closest that we will come to an education issue that the Democrats may push that might not have 100% agreement from the Republicans. But even that, I just don't see as us doing in, in isolation. Um, I really don't. So. 
Thank you all. And we'll turn to Karen for the live audience questions. Yeah, so moving on to the audience questions. Uh, the first question is for Representative McLaughlin, Senator Lending, and Senator Buckner. Um, Carolyn and Alex actually asked this, and they said making rigor the responsibility of parents is a very inefficient model. Yes, parents absolutely should advocate for their children. However, the approach is reactive instead of proactive and ultimately inequitable. What funding conversations are happening in regards to providing high quality materials that drive rigor? And how is not fully funding school district budgets putting students first? That second question is absolutely on target. <laughs> we say we put education first, but we forget to fund it sometimes. And it's not for lack of trying at the state part. Um, we have to have a balanced budget. So if we add more to education, we have to take it from somewhere else. And um, that's always a hard argument to make. We've already taken from higher education, um, you know, prison system. There's a lot of people who are vying for the same dollars on there. Um, as far as the rigor goes, I don't think we, we can't mandate rigor, but we can certainly encourage it. Um, I am running a math bill this year. Um, and Senator Lundin, I think you were on this last year. It's kind of, it, didn't, it didn't go through. We were doing it with uh, Representative Larson and it didn't go through. So um, we'd like for you to join this again with us, of course, but um, it is to kind of train teachers how to teach math to make it rigorous. I think um, especially in elementary schools, people are finding that the teachers, um, they kind of know math, but don't know how to teach math, which is often a different skill set than just knowing it. And um, so we're trying to do a train the trainer where we, um, we train elementary teachers how to do rigorous math and also train the parents about how to help their kids at home. So we get a little of both in there. Um, but we can't really mandate um, rigor. We hope for it. We encourage it. Um, we test this, you know, we grade the schools on how they're doing with rigor. But um, I think we were suggesting that one way to tell a teacher that he or she is not providing enough rigor for their child is to actually go talk to that teacher. So I'm not saying we should let um, the parents drive the curriculum necessarily, but they need to have their voices heard. Um, and I would hope every teacher wants to teach rigorously and wants to challenge every student in their class. So, um, so I think we were answering the question as to you know a parent involvement in it, but there's a lot more involved in it than just right. having a parent say. So I'll dive in next. The the question of fully funded, um, sadly by definition, fully funded is whatever gets spent. Um, the, the whatever gets spent um, has been defined um, by the majority party now for I, many years. Um, the reality is I would look at the entire state budget very differently. Um, for me, the state budget is or the state government has a very limited number of responsibilities um, and education is one of them. I think it's tragic that we do not pay teachers as professionals, that we do not reward and honor the exceptional teachers with even greater pay than, than their peers, because then their peers would seek to add more rigor to their personal training, and that would, I believe, bring more rigor into their classroom. Um, to the question of rigor itself, and actually one more thing on fully funded, um, the fully funded model such that it is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, doesn't even fund all of the students at the same level. Um, you know, 15% of the student population, the charter students, some portion, a large portion of them, just because of a, a policy um, element that says they are authorized by a different group, the Charter School Institute, they get less money. And so they're even less fully funded than all the other students um, in all the other districts. Um, to the question of rigor, um, I am the grandson of an educator, the son of an educator, and believe me, I know what rigor is. Um, at the end of the day, parents need to demand rigor, and the, the great teachers, in my experience, they bring rigor into their classroom. Now, we as a matter of policy seek to set standards, and we try to make those standards higher through the State Board of Education over time, and that should bring rigor. But it's at the end of the day, rigor comes out of a cultural choice high standards, high expectations, 
That is what drives rigor. It's an individual leadership question at, in the classroom, in the school, and quite frankly, in the district. Um, Carolyn and Alex, I really appreciate this question. And I don't know what the answer is. I think that so many of us don't know what the answer is, and that's why so many of us and so many school districts and so many students are in the situation we're in now, why so many teachers are in the situation we have now. So I'll be honest with you, I'm not just gonna give you an answer because I don't even know what the right answer is for this question. Just keep throwing out questions like this to make us think, to make hold us accountable as legislators to do everything we can but I'm not trying to skirt your question. I just don't even know what the answer is. And I'm just being totally honest with you. Thank you all for that. This question is for Senator Zenzinger and Representative McLaughlin. From this, and it's from Debbie, Annalise, and Mark. Can you speak to anticipated investments in early learning? How will early childhood educators be compensated at a rate equivalent to elementary educators? And how will you ensure children have a quality experience? Well, it's a good question. Um, <laughs> so we do have a brand new Department of Early Childhood in Colorado, and um, it was it was almost it almost brought me to tears actually listening to the uh, executive director and um, her team present to the Joint Budget Committee for their very first budget hearing uh, about all the progress that they have made. Uh, but that office was just stood up in July. So we still have a lot of work to do uh, with regard to early childhood uh, learning. And I think um, our, our governor's budget proposal really reflects a priority on early childhood in a way that um, our state has never uh, seen before. Uh, and so, but the challenging part is, as you've um, so aptly put it, uh, how do we make sure that we support it financially to a degree that it deserves? Um, and that includes everything from making sure that the teachers are, are getting an adequate uh, salary, that we are um, getting our workforce up to speed so that we can um, provide more uh, early childhood settings. Uh, I think the department has done a really good job of taking on a new model and trying to implement it with fidelity. And there are going to be some hiccups, uh, but uh, I feel pretty good about the direction that we're going. There is a proposal to increase the amount of preschool hours, um, I think, to, to do some additional um, time uh, than what was initially proposed last year. And we're trying to uh, manage the budget in such a way that we could support that. But somebody, I think it was Rep McLaughlin, said it a moment ago that if we do put more money into early childhood education, then and that means that we have less money to potentially put into K-12 education to close that um, the budget stabilization factor, or we won't have enough money to be able to close the, the gap in higher education. <laughs> um, it means that we won't have the ability to uh, better fund adult education. Fine. So um, lots of challenges out there, but I, I agree with you. Yeah, it takes a lot of money, but it's an investment. I think when you pay money into early childhood education. Um, I taught high school. And so I know that when kids had a really good background of early education, um, they came in with the skills needed to be successful as they got older. Um, you know, they knew how to work in groups. They knew how to do their homework. They knew how to read and write officially. They knew how to be critical thinkers. And um, this all starts at a very early age. So Though I really, I'm very in favor of having um, early childhood education, it does take money. And that's why we have this, um, it's a committee, it's a board, whatever it is. I'm not sure what exactly we call it, but um, it's a group of people. And that's all they're thinking about right now is how do we pay good teachers to be in here? What are we teaching? How many hours do um, students need? Um, we don't want it to be a babysitting service. We want it to be actual education that gets them ready uh, for the next step of kindergarten. Uh, we now have full day kindergarten in the schools, which I'm really happy about. Um, but they're going slowly and surely with this method. They're not just jumping in and saying, here's what we're going to do. Um, here's the curriculum we're gonna do and let's get going. 
um, the people behind this are being very, very thoughtful about um, what they're pursuing and why they're pursuing it. And, um, you know, we, we need steady sources of income for these because we can't just say we're going to do this and then in two years go, oops, we ran out of money. We can't have preschool anymore. So, um, so there just has to be a lot of thoughtfulness in here. And um, I'm hoping that they um, continue to do that. Um, just now, I just heard today that um, this the early childhood um, department will be under the um, um, education department. So we will be addressing those in our committees. And uh, so I look forward to that. Yes, I was the proud sponsor of the universal pre-K bill. And we are thrilled with uh, the progress that we're making. Um, and there is some legislation coming that's going to improve the compensation rates for those early childhood uh, providers, I mean, teachers, to try to equal, uh, to level the playing ground uh, for the pay. And uh, the universal pre-K program will actually be in effect fall of 2023 of the progress we are making is just outstanding. And right now we already have over 500 providers who have signed up and we're encouraging people to go to the website uh, to make sure that they are um, represented. Um, I, I'm just absolutely thrilled and this program is outstanding and it's just going to keep getting better and um, stay tuned. Thank you so much. Um, now let's hear from two of you. This question is from Meredith. An increase in pay is incre incredibly appreciated, but educator workload is often unsustainable and overwhelming. What structural changes have you heard from educators or thought of personally that could help retain educators who are struggling with the workload? And any, any two of you can answer. <laughs> Um, as the grandson, son, husband, father of educators, I know how hard um, educators um, lean into their job and, and do the work. And, and at the same time, my experience is it's it's amazing the effectiveness uh, that uh, those who who do lean in so hard and work so hard bring, and the difference they make in in, in students and children's lives. It's not something that I think we can fix structurally. Um, my emphasis and where I continue to lean into this is to, to seek to get more money into the paychecks of those student facing teachers. Um, I see them as kind of the, the, the pointy edge of the spear, if you will, the leading edge of the vanguard, um, pick your metaphor, but, but they're the ones behind whom we should all gather and help them propel forward. And so rewarding them financially um, for the incredible work and effort that they put in um, doesn't solve the weight. It doesn't, it doesn't lift the burden of, of a, uh, the, the workload of a professional um, environment, but it certainly um, makes it uh, a little bit more sustainable when you understand I'm being honored because I'm being well paid for the work I'm doing. And that's the place where I'm trying to push in. Um, I, I don't know that uh, I would seek to lower the expectations that the great teachers put upon themselves, but I certainly want them to be paid, paid much better for putting that expectation on themselves. I think we need to be very cautious about how many mandates we put on teachers um, in the classroom. You know, you have to teach this, you have to teach this. And um, when we add new things without the resources to help them learn about these things that they're teaching, they have to do that on their own, which means that on weekends and nights, um, they're just trying to stay a day ahead of students. So when we do have programs put in, we need to make sure that there's a lot of material available. Um, for instance, I'm doing a bill and it, I'm not sure if it'll affect many of you, but um, it's about water literacy. Water is really important in Colorado. And um, this will be an optional program, but we will have um, everything online about what kind of classes they could teach. So if a teacher wants to do this in their classroom for science or history or whatever about the value of water in Colorado, um, they will have everything available to them. So they're not gonna have to do the extra work of designing curriculum and lesson plans. 
And we're hoping that um, if they find that time and energy and inclination to do it, that they will use it, but uh, we are not making a mandate on it. Um, and I think people are always saying, you should have all the teachers do this and this and this, and that will kill somebody. So um, we're trying not to kill any teachers. We really like them. Can I jump in? Of course. So uh, we think of teachers as being the only educator, and there are a team of people that support um, this endeavor called education. Uh, but a lot of those positions are, are short right now. So I think about paraeducators. So having somebody in the classroom to give a little bit of extra attention to the, the learners that are struggling um, helps allow the, the classroom teacher to stay on course with the majority of the class, but then not allow that learner to get behind because they'll have that one-on-one -on -one support, somebody in their corner to help. Um, having, uh, make sure that we're fully funding special education so that our special educators can uh, assist with IEPs and um, creating um, scaffold learning uh, plans and, and, and help uh, do some thinking with the classroom teacher about how to address a particular student's needs so that it's not all on the classroom teacher to figure that out. Um, when we under uh, fund education and we lack these other critical pieces of the education team, um, that creates more burdens for the individual classroom teacher. So um, I, I even think of it as uh, myself as a guest teacher, um, you know, formerly called substitute, if you don't have substitutes, think about the burden that that even, you know, places on our, our teachers. I had uh, one teacher that really needed to take off and it wasn't because of a doctor's appointment or anything. It's because they were so behind on their grading um, that they, they didn't have time to provide the kind of feedback that they wanted on their um, on their essays for their writing class. Um, and, and they couldn't take off because there were no substitutes that were available. So, I mean, it's, it's a team approach. And I think we have to be mindful of that. And if we're supporting those other uh, team members, then I think it will help lessen the burden in addition to everything that everybody else said. <laughs> yes, I'd like to add, I, I agree with everything that's been said and thank you for your perspective, um, Senator Zenzinger, because that is so true. Teachers do not feel respected right now. They don't feel appreciated. There are so many more demands being put on them for all the reasons we've talked about earlier. So let's keep lifting our teachers up let them know that we really are listening. But right now they are feeling totally unappreciated and disrespected and feel that they're being blamed for things that are happening that are out of their control. So let's keep lifting up teachers and letting them keep talking about what they need from us. And it's not just all about the money. Yes, the money is an important part of it and their pay is important, but it's not just the money right now. It's the respect. Thank you all for your responses. Um, if we might have time for one or two more questions, possibly one, depending on on how uh, how long the answers are. So let's hear from two of you as well, um, and anyone can answer. This is from Nicholas. In your view, what can and should be done to address the systemic failures in the Adams 14 district? Senator Buckner, it looks like you, you want to say something. <laughs> I want to say something, um, but Nicholas, um, this is such a complicated question and I don't know all of the details, but there are systemic failures, not just in Adams 14, but in many other districts as well. And as chair of education this year, I'm hoping I can have a closer pulse on what some of those systemic failures are and address those. And um, 
I don't know if I have a great answer, but it's really sad what happened in Adams 14. And as the chair, new Senate Ed chair, I will dig into this deeper. And not only for Adams 14, like I said, for all school districts to look at the um, failures that are occurring that we're aware of and make those people accountable. Mayor Lundin, I think I heard you jumping in there before. Uh, well, I was going to say it's it's a difficult question. It's not a question that really the, the legislature has um, a, a uh, process connection directly to more broadly. We've got some connection to the system. It more resides with the accountability process that's happening at the State Board of Education, the elements of what's going on within the district. And like uh, uh, Senator Buckner, I do not know the details um, and I'm not current. I mean, I was following it uh, earlier on, but I have not been following the most recent move. So I, I really don't have an informed comment except to, to say that it does point up the challenge. There's a challenge there. And as Senator Buckner said, there are many other areas where there are challenges as well, as well and we need to lean in, be accountable for that and actually do what we can to resolve the issues sooner rather than later. I mean, these there are hundreds and thousands of students that are negatively impacted when things are spiral, spiraling in a negative way, such, they, such as they are in that district. And um, quickly, I, I think it showed, um, I think it showed a flaw in our system that we we wanted schools to be accountable and you put them on the clock, but nobody kind of knew what to do if it went beyond that. Um, and I, I hope we have learned a lot um, from Adams 14 about, you know, what we should and shouldn't do. Um, it had to be they needed, instead of somebody telling them what to do, they, it needed to be a community. It needed to be the school deciding what they, they saw they needed. They knew their kids better than anybody else. They knew the teachers. Nobody in that district is stupid. You know, it wasn't like they just had a bunch of people who had no idea what education should look like. Um, they all did, and they've been trying really hard. I know that. But once you start slipping, it's really hard. It's hard to get back on there. But I think they have some great support. Um, and I hope we've learned um, from what happened with them, what we should do the next time. And I, I hope there is no next time, but um, they need to be a role model for what other, um, what other schools need to do to not get to that point. And if they do get to that point, what to do next that um, will help a lot of students. That is time. Um, I could listen to you all talk for the rest of the day, but um, unfortunately we have to let you go. So. Thank you all um, to who are on this panel today uh, for being in attendance and all of you out there um, on Zoom, thank you for attending as well. Be on the lookout for an email um, from us with a recording of, of the event. I want to ex extend a special thank you to our event sponsor, the Colorado Education Association. And thank you for our event partner, the Margaret College of Education at the University of Denver. Um, as you sign off from this event, we have a survey that will pop up and take two minutes to complete. It's super easy. Um, fill it out for us. It helps us really better our events into the future. Um, thank you so much to Karen for um, co-hosting or co-moderating with us. Um, you did an amazing job. Uh, and thank you all. Have a great rest of the day. Enjoy.